Good evening, and welcome to Democratic Women, a conversation with the community. I'm your host, Dr. Terry Jory. Tonight, we're going to have a conversation with our elected officials, Supervisor Doss Williams and Congressman Salud Carbajal, about common sense red flag laws, which permit police or family members to petition the court for the temporary removal of firearms from someone who may present a danger to others or themselves. Supervisor Williams will discuss the GVRO, Gun Violence Restraining Order, and Congressman Carbajal will speak about its federal companion, ERPO, Extreme Risk Protection Order. The GVRO was in response to the 2014 Isla Vista mass shootings, where the gunman killed six people and injured 14. The gunman's parents contacted the police because they had grave concerns about their son. The police interviewed the gunman, but found him to be, in their words, polite and kind. And therefore, nothing was done, so the gunman proceeded on his rampage. Prior to that, there was Sandy Hook mass shooting, where the gunman killed his mother before proceeding on his rampage, killing 20 children and six staff. Since then, we've had many more mass shootings, to name a few, Aurora, Colorado, San Bernardino, Las Vegas, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and Thousand Oaks Borderline Bar and Grill. As Bernard Malucky and the undersheriff of Santa Barbara County at the time of the Isla Vista mass shooting said, how and when should government intervene in the lives of the strange? There has to be a line between arresting people and doing nothing. Our first guest, Supervisor Doss Williams, is taking action by crafting the gun violence restraining order. Please help me welcome Supervisor Doss Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Supervisor Williams. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, to talk about the GVRO, Gun Violence Restraining Order. Um, my first question I'd like to know is, what inspired you to want to get the GVRO legislation written and implemented? Not just Isla Vista, but what inside you said, we have to have some legislation for this? Well, I think it's important that at first, when a tragedy happens, I think it's important not to prejudge the facts on the ground, but it really was the facts on the ground that made me wonder why couldn't there be something done? If people knew there was a problem, it wasn't just um, uh, the, the perpetrator's parents, but it was also his former roommates yeah. who moved out um, ahead of time because they uh -huh. felt endangered. Um, and my point is, if you feel endangered, you should take action. You shouldn't just move out and let someone else face the danger that you might have been in. Um, and that's why the gun violence restraining order in the state of California is based on household. So family mm -hmm. members can request a gun violence restraining order, law enforcement can, but Family includes anyone who's living with you in California law. So let's give an example so that people know. If, say for example, I'm feeling threatened, I have a family member that I feel for some reason has some guns and I'm fearful that he's going to do something or she, what can I do? Well, you would petition a court and you can either do that in the traditional manner or there's even a convenient website that a local ad, that an advocacy group is set up speak for speak for safety dot org mm -hmm. where people could fill out a petition uh, wherever they live in the state of California uh, or you can go to your local court and petition for a gun violence restraining order now that initial contact after a petition if it is uh, deemed to be a possible threat uh, uh, either the person being a danger to themselves or a danger to others, uh, the court will then take away, send someone to take away the weapons, and then the person who owns the weapons has the uh, opportunity to explain to the court and tell them why 
the person may be wrong. Uh, so there is um, a judicial procedure. And just like a domestic violence restraining order request, there's a chance for the named party to explain themselves and make a case against it. How do, does the court know that all the guns have been given up? Because, that, let me just say that if the person has 100 guns and the court um, takes away 99 or the person surrenders 99 guns, there's still that one. Sure. And we don't know because we don't have gun registration yet. Registr well, in, in California, we do have yeah. gun registration. Uh, we don't have it in every, every state uh, mm -hmm. to the same uh, degree that we do here. Uh, but of course, uh, an awful lot of guns, also black market guns uh, as well. So no, no tool like this is going to be perfect. Um, I think it, you just have to view it as a tool. And you, it, it's part of the solution. Uh, but particularly in other states, though, I would advocate for other state legislatures mm -hmm. to pass a, a red flag law, and many are. So California was a, a trendsetter, I'm proud to say. Uh, uh, even though the sad part it was was a trendsetter yeah. because of terrible yeah. um, tragedy, the fact that other legislatures are doing it is good. But you also have to do other basic steps in other states or around the country, which is to stop making it so easy to buy a lot of guns legally, which is the predominant way that weapons then become black market weapons. Um, uh, I looked up and it looks like there are eight states and the Wash and Washington DC who have passed GVRO. Do they contact you or how, how do we keep moving this forward? I have had a lot of uh, contacts from uh, legislators in other states, but there really are great organizations, um, uh, you know, uh, advocating for this in other states. It's not, ex it's not like you have to depend all on Californians. There's people indigenous to those states that are advocating for it. In addition, what's really amazing is uh, one of the parents of the victims that I've worked with um, a lot over the last couple of years, uh, Richard Martinez, he has been tireless and he has yeah. gone in person and yeah. lobby in many of these uh, state legislatures. And I find that to be very courageous because, mm -hmm. well, with a wife, uh, that's a psychologist. I know mm -hmm. he's re-traumatizing himself, yeah. um, and that's a tremendous sacrifice to make yeah. on behalf of all of us. What do, What do you think um, are the most important elements, and what would you like viewers to take away from this? Well, the most important thing is that we c can prevent some tragedies, mm -hmm. and uh, people sometimes think of mass killings as being very rare. Uh, first of all, they're really not that rare. But for every person that we could save from a mass killing, uh, we could save probably 20 or 30 or mm -hmm. 50 from suicide. Yeah. Because suicide happens in this community all the time. And so if you know someone um, who ha could pose a danger to themselves or others, it's not loyal to them to be silent. It's loyal to them to take action mm -hmm. and to get a, yes. a weapon that if you know that they have a, a weapon and that capability to get that weapon out of their hands and, and um, a legitimate way to do it. Uh, if you can't do that in your interpersonal re relationship is to do it through a gun violence restraining order. And again, uh, you know, if someone, if a viewer is curious about it, go to speakforsafety.org and you have a little fact sheet and an easy mm -hmm. way uh, to petition a court. Yes, yeah, speakforsafety.org um, is great. I want to ask you one more thing, and then I'm going to bring in Salud Carbajal. Um, so if you go to speakforsafety.org, can you uh, petition right online as That's opposed right. to going right down to the court? It has a link right on there where you can petition the court. Okay, great. Of course, um, in Santa Barbara, <clears throat> you can just walk down to our beautiful courthouse. Right, right. Um, I'm going to bring in Congressman Salud Carbajal to update us on the GVRO's federal companion, ERPO, 
Extreme Risk Protection Order. Uh, Congressman Carbajal, are you there? I am, yeah. uh, Dr. Jory. Yeah, thank you for being here um, to discuss your involvement with ERPO. I know it's late on the East Coast. Yes, but this is a good topic. Uh, I don't like it all. Great. Um, where does your passion for common sense gun laws come from? Well, I think it comes um, from a, a number of, of sources or reasons. Uh, one is we certainly cannot deny that we are experiencing a gun violence epidemic in our country. And we look no further than our own community of Ida Vista, as you and Supervisor Williams were discussing now, just a few years ago in Ida Vista, we experienced a senseless uh, tragedy uh, of, of gun violence. And third, I would say, I have personal experience uh, with grief and experiencing such a tragedy in my family. My sister, when I was a little boy, she was my oldest sister, uh, committed suicide with my father's revolver. And um, I was the one who found my sister. And so I know firsthand uh, the pain that comes along with senseless gun violence. And so that's what motivates me, uh, the epidemic, uh, the tragedy in our own uh, backyard, our own community, and my own personal experience. Well, thank you for sharing your um, personal story with us. Can you give us an update on where ERPO stands with Congress and the various states? Yeah, well, as, as you were discussing, uh, ERPO is the um, Extreme Risk Protection Order Act, which is legislation that provides a grant program to incentivize other states to do what California has done, yeah. to implement extreme risk protection orders, also known as gun violence restraining order uh, law, so that we could continue to expand on these common sense laws, red flag laws. Uh, they're really important programs. We have seen in California that they work in Santa Barbara County in particular. We have a number of, of demonstrated cases where uh, this tool has provided families, law enforcement, to petition the court to provide due process, but yet be able to take guns temporarily away from individuals who have demonstrated that they are a danger to themselves or others. And again, providing due process. Uh, and this would be temporary taking the guns away and also uh, restricting individuals. Why, why did you feel the need to um, legislate with, with ERPO? We have the GVRO, and I guess... Well, I think, again, I think, again, we have a great example in California of mm -hmm. how this, this type of law is working. Uh, I teamed up with Senator Feinstein, so this legislation is bipartisan and bicameral, meaning uh, Republicans and Democrats, it also includes the Senate and the House of Representatives. And uh, again, this is one a law that is a common sense law that I'm hoping makes it over the finish line and we can do nationally what we have done in California. And I applaud uh, Supervisor Williams when he was in the legislature. Uh, he was instrumental in moving uh, the um, AB 1014 forward with the signature of Governor Brown. And again, I, I, I'm inspired uh, with the work that has been done in California to try to do something similar nationally. Again, we have had in uh, Sandy Hook over 1,500 mass shootings in the United States. And this is senseless violence that we need to get our hands around. And it should be a, a bipartisan issue. Mm -hmm. Regrettably, the NRA and the gun lobby have such a stranglehold on uh, the Republican Party that regrettably, uh, there doesn't seem to be a will or an interest to work on 
principal laws to move forward. I am very grateful to have found a number of Republicans that have supported this bill in the last Congress and are supporting the bill this Congress. Um, just so far, I have 98 co-sponsors. I believe that will grow as, as in the previous uh, Congress to uh, extensively, uh, and again, in a bipartisan way. Quickly, one last question. Um, I have information here that 14 states have passed um, ERPO. So, yeah, and it's, and it's important to recognize that they all are slightly similar and slightly different. And that's why mm. the grant program that is part of the Extreme Risk Protection Order Act doesn't necessarily, it's not over prescriptive. It doesn't say you shall do it this way. It takes into consideration that there's diversity in how we approach these red flag uh, extreme protection order right laws, GBRO laws, so that more states are incentivized to do this. Yeah, that's great. So each each community can adapt it to what they need. Well, that's great. Let's take some let's take some questions from our studio audience. Um, but I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to gather your thoughts. We took our cameras out to the streets of Santa Barbara and asked people whether they were familiar with the GVRO and ERPO and what their thoughts were about those measures. Let's take a look. So, do you know about the gun violence restraining order? Uh, no, it's uh, the first time. No, I don't. Did you hear what the GVRO is, Gun Violence Restraining oh, yeah. Order? Okay, what do you think about that? And can you like, explain it to me a little bit? What this legislation does is it allows a household member or a family member or even the police to temporarily take away the guns for a month up to 12 months. I think it's a good idea as long as it's protected by something at least. Because like if it's just out of nowhere, there's no reason against it, and I feel like the straps shouldn't be taken away. I I agree with that. Like, but there have to be like a system to evaluate this. Yes, who can have it and who cannot? Because if I understand that I like uh, possessing the gun in America, it's easy to get. Well, I think we should have a system to systematically take away all guns permanently. So in the absence of that ability, then surely in high-risk cases, it seems almost common sense to take away tools of easy and mass violence away from those who we suspect might use them. So whether it's a day, a week, a month, 12 months, ideally forever, and not even for those individuals, for all individuals. Well, we are going to take some studio audience questions right now. Jill? Well, I, you know, I, I, I think of this community as being uh, somewhat um, uh, culturally a little bit more uh, uh, resistant to guns, um, but I'm shocked every year at how many guns we get in uh, through our gun buyback program uh, that's held once a year and will be um, uh, held once again this June 15th at Earl Warren Showgrounds. Uh, so I encourage folks, if they have a weapon, uh, that um, they don't use anymore, they've inherited, may not be registered, somehow it's found their way. Uh, guns are statistically far more likely to be used against someone um, that is not real conversant with them than it is to be able to be used in self-defense. And so a weapon that's neglected is a very dangerous thing. Uh, and so uh, I encourage people to come on by. What, um, how many uh, guns were involved in the gun buyback last year? Oh God, we, we had so much that we didn't, that it exceeded uh -huh. the maximum that we thought would, would come. It was literally hundreds that day. And we, you know, some people were turned away. So if, if you also are just somebody who's concerned about it, you can do something. Uh, you can make a donation to the Coalition Against Gun Violence. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, who, uh, uh, you know, is 
the sponsor of that and the an organizer of that, or what we typically give people to incentivize them to uh, give up their guns is uh, uh, gift certificates, gift certificates to grocery stores or other things. Um, uh, you can uh, a good thing is our local theater group, Metropolitan Theater Corporation, mm -hmm. is giving uh, you know movie tickets, um, oh. but you could. Uh, give donate money or gift certificates and either one would help the effort if somebody's interested in doing a gun, gun buyback do they just show up just show up with oh. the, with the weapon okay great any other questions yes I have a question for salute I'm curious about some of the challenges in getting the violence against women act passed and how some of the gun issues in that legislation mm -hmm some of these uh, legislative uh, actually successes and wins. I want to get that clear. So the question salute is about the um, Women Against um, Violence Act and what's going on with that and how it relates to the gun issues that we're talking about. Well, I, it's extremely related uh, because we know that we have seen much violent gun violence incidences uh, against women um, by men uh, in the case of domestic violence. And so they are closely related and associated. And I think in California, again, uh, we have many laws that um, address gun violence uh, as another reason to withhold uh, the ability to possess or purchase guns. And so I think uh, the VAWA, as we call it, uh, is extremely important to raise awareness, to ensure that we're doing everything possible to mirror um, laws that continue to <coughs> highlight that um, gun violence is, is, is a major epidemic in general, but in particular, it affects uh, by perpetrators, uh, violence against women in a significant way. Is the VAWA, uh, Violence Against Women Act, is that going to be reintroduced? It has been reintroduced in the House of Representatives. Uh, we have passed it. It now needs to move forward in the Senate mm -hmm. and ultimately signed by this president. But for, uh, for the first time in many Great. We're going to go back to our studio audiences. Mary? Mary? What, what way do you get women to feel safe enough to come forward if they have a partner with a gun? Or what, what services are offered to the women to protect them? So Marion's question was, how do you get women who are in a situation that they're fearful, how do you get them to come forward with a gun or without? I think that's a really... Uh, big problem. I would say that in some counties like our own, we have a, a, a better services um, and it's treated in a different way. I would say that we have particular DAs that get assigned that have special skills in cases like this. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I've had an incident uh, close to our operation um, and so seeing how it works uh, through the eyes of one of uh, someone close to me, and uh, uh, it was uh, very well done, um, treated with respect. The woman was treated with a great deal of respect, and I think done in a way to make her feel more safe. Um, but fear is the reason why people don't come forward and request domestic violence restraining orders, or in this case, sometimes gun violence restraining orders, and lack of knowledge about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised that the majority of the people that you mm -hmm. interviewed had no idea what you were talking exactly. about. Exactly. Uh, because yes. uh, even in Santa Barbara County, where the information is fairly high, 
the majority of the requests are coming from law enforcement and, and not from uh, the public. And so we need to get the word out, right, uh, about, about, yeah. the, about the subject. Yeah, one of the reasons I wanted to have this program on the GVRO and IRPA is because I know from personal experience as a sexual assault counselor that many of my clients don't know, most never heard of the GVRO. And I'm hoping that we can educate and raise consciousness. And I'm wondering if you, uh, Supervisor Williams, or Salud, um, have any ideas how we can go about doing that? I think we, especially if we can get to the people that someone who's in trouble might go to, whether that's a psychologist, a priest, a counselor, a PTA group. I mean, of course, we've had high profile scares right here in our own schools. And, um, you know, getting out information in that way in those that's networks. Yeah, those are all great ideas. And I appreciate both of you, uh, Supervisor Williams and Congressman Carbajal for staying up late with us and sharing and having a conversation with us on the great work you're doing. And we appreciate it. Let's give them a hand. Thank, thank you, Salud. I'd like to introduce someone who keeps our Democratic Women organization together as a community. Please help me welcome Democratic Women President Christina Pizarro. Hello, Christina. Hi, you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, so are there a few things that you'd like to share with our audience? Absolutely. Um, Democratic Women of Santa Barbara County has been around for almost 49 years. And so we are excited to have been a presence for that long. Uh, we champion and promote democratic principles, and um, we work closely with partner organizations, ensuring voter participation, voter integrity, and election integrity. Those are our main vision, mission, and values that we have. And um, we have done a lot of work. We also endorse a lot of candidates that share those values. And um, it's been a lot of work, but we are proud to do it. We love to engage the public, mm -hmm. and uh, that is just the work that we do. We have uh, very devoted board members and, com and committees, and uh, we're out there in the community. And we have some of our board members here in the audience. We'd like to thank them, Marion Shapiro yes, thank you. and Jill Dexter and Christina Shelley. Um, so 49 years. Um, Democratic Women, so next year is our big 50th. That's correct, and we are so excited. It's a milestone that we have reached, and uh, we just want to continue to do that work that's critical in our country. Great, so that's our program for today. Thank you for joining us. Drop us a line on our Facebook page. We'd love to hear from you, and I want to tell you, have an empowering day.